to Takiya.com and make games out of it. And I would practice so that when I play you a bubble, I don't just beat you, I crush you. Right? There are people in the world like me, and you know who they are in your class, and the first to raise their hand, and they just want to be like, show off how smart you hands they are. So when you do competition, you're like putting a, a leaderboard up or something like this, it really is actually demotivating to most students. You know, your students like me, yeah, that does motivate us. But it's going to have the opposite effect on a lot of students. If you don't feel that you have the ability to be successful, then it's going to actually detract from the learning process. It's not going to do what you think it does. So I think the best competition is competition against yourself. So you, you use short-term goal setting, this is where I am, and then this is where I want to be, and that's where your competition goes, is comparing against yourself. I would just really caution you strongly, students with low self-efficacy, that just is not going to be a huge motivator for them. Again, with giving rewards, rewards is a lot of times associated with gamification, it's associated negatively, but we give rewards, rewards and, and different things in terms of praise and um, stickers. Anyway, research shows that if you start to give rewards, you can't take it away. So if you're going to do it, you need to have some sustaining power that you're willing to do it all semester and keep going with it. Badges, um, a lot of times I don't even like to talk about badges because people think they're so synonymous with gamification. So a badge is basically a visual identifier of some sort of an achievement, uh, kind of a micro certificate. So many ways to do badges badly, um, but that's really a popular gamification technique that you see in a lot of apps like the Starbucks app and some of these things that gamify um, what they're doing. For me, this is hugely important, is that I need to provide a low risk of failure. So when I play a video game and I try and beat up the bad guy and he kills me, What's my punishment? I have to do it again, right? And I keep, I keep doing it and I try new strategies. You know, when you give a kid a game, do they read the directions? Do you, when you start a new game, do you read the directions? No, you just jump in and you die. Why, why are you willing to do that? Because it has a low risk of failure. There's not really any consequences when you die and when you fail. You're like, you kind of learn how to do it through failure. I think I learn a lot more through failure than I do through success. But the problem is, is our kids are really conditioned that whatever they do, we mark it in the grade book and we burn it with a laser. And so that low grade just screams out to you forever. Uh, quizzes drive me bonkers because what, you have three or five questions on there? So if you have a three question quiz, okay, that's awesome. Kicking her in an A, a D, or an F. We've just set that kid up to fail. And then I put that score in the grade book and it shows, hey, you got two out of three, which isn't actually too bad because they only missed one. But now it shows that they have a D. And every time they go and look at the grade book, their progress report shows that they're a failure. And so I'm really passionate about not calling kids failures, not labeling them as failures. So how can you build into your class a low risk of failure? They can try something and try again, try something, try again, and they can uh, iterate through it to get to the process rather than you telling them what to do and then they make it back. That's really hard for kids to understand, especially if they're older kids and they're used to a certain system of you tell them what to do and they're gonna do exactly what you said and you're like, well, we're going to do inquiry and we're gonna play and we're gonna figure it out. They're so afraid to fail. So you really have to train them that it's okay to fail and it's something we celebrate in our class. So I made a badge called the I'm a Failure Badge uh, for my students so they can celebrate what they fail at most. So at the end of the semester, they present all of their work to me, their digital portfolio. And the thing I just love the most is how many students sit in front of me at their presentation, it's one-on-one, -on -one, and they're just like, I failed at all this stuff. Like they are bragging about how much stuff they failed at. And then follow that up with, I learned so much, let me show you. That's my proudest moment. So creating a low risk of failure. If you ever played a game and it all of a sudden gives you an achievement or a badge and you had no idea, you're like, what is that? Why did I get it? And so I'm just thinking, why even have them if I don't have something I can goal set for? So whatever it is that you want students to do, if you're going to give them badges or whatever you're going to have, is that you, you set a goal, but they know how to get there. So what do a lot of times kids say their goal is? I'm going to get a B. Oh, you're going to get a B. Awesome. How are you going to do that? I'm going to work hard. Okay, you're going to fail. I mean, you don't have specific ways to get there. So setting them up with known outcomes, things they can goal set for, and that you can celebrate. I'm all about finding excuses to celebrate in class. And I know this is dumb, but have any of you ever seen The X-Files? Nobody? So it's a TV show. Yeah, they're actually bringing it back. Uh, and so they had an episode with the Chupacabra. Does anyone know what the Chupacabra is? Yes. 
if the Mexican boogeyman like a goat sucker. So anyway, long story short, if you're using a Google Doc and you have anonymous people in there, uh, it's one of the anonymous animals is the chupacabra. So if you don't know this, that particular episode was filmed in Fresno, where I live. So that is my class mascot, is the chupacabra. So every time the chupacabra shows up in one of my Google Docs, we have a rule we have to stand up and cheer because there's just not enough opportunities in class to have fun and to cheer for things. So I think to myself, how can I find ways to cheer for my students? Because that's things that we do in games. Games give me immediate feedback. So if I give students homework, so I'm like, I'm just going to give you 10 problems. Go home, do 10 homework problems. I'm like, oh, you are so close. Do you see this? Like, you're just missing the negative. You know, like, you with me? You see your mistake? Yes. Can you redo that? Laugh now, right? The kids are not going to redo it even though it's 10 problems because when you're done, you just mentally think that you're done and you don't want to go back and redo it. So I hear a lot of teachers like, I let them redo it, but they just don't. Right, because they think they're done. So these, what you get out of video games is when I kill the bad guy, or when I get killed, I immediately know it. When I earn 10 points XP, it's like 10 points just float up on the screen, right? I know right then that I got it. So one of the things that I do is I have students keep track of their own scores through a spreadsheet, and they exit off, which is kind of similar to that uh, template that I shared with you at the beginning. It immediately levels them up. As soon as they check it off, they're leveled up, so they get that immediate feedback. The other thing I like to do is I have a rule that if the computer can grade it, it should, because so lower uh, DOK levels or simple question answer things that the computer can grade, multiple choice. I'm gonna find some sort of a computer game to, for them to do that on, because they get one question wrong and it tells them. They didn't do 10 questions wrong, they did one. They'll try and figure it out, do a second problem, they won't do a third if they get it wrong. They know they need to come get help before they move on. So immediate feedback, I think that's really most doable if you have some computers. Um, and I think that really is something that, uh, it's a, a really big deal that we need to incorporate into our classrooms. Showing visible progress, like with a, with levels, progress bars, badges. When you play a video game, you always notice it right there in your face. You know that you're being successful. It says right or wrong, visually, right? Uh, and auditorily often. So how can you give students visible progress so they know that their efforts are moving them forward? Scaffolding. You play Angry Birds, the first thing they do is it's really simple, right? You uh, pull your finger back and it models that and you have to kill one bird. Right? And it's a really simple way. You're pretty much guaranteed to be successful. And then it builds harder and harder. So I play World of Warcraft. Uh, level one, I need 450 points to get to level two. And after I turn in my first quest, I'm pretty much guaranteed that I'm going to level up to level two. I am now level 85. I've been playing this for a year and a half, and I'm still level 85. I mean, I've been level 85 for a year and a half. I'm getting my doctorate, and I have five children, so I don't have a whole lot of time to dedicate to this. But I need... 2.6 million XP to get to the next level. Why am I not frustrated? Why have I not given up on this video game where it's literally taking me a year and a half to get to the next level? It's because I have 85 levels of success to build on, right? Success builds success. So one way to gamify my class is just to realize I need to start students at a level that they can be successful at and then help them to find success and scaffold their way up as opposed to I have students in my math class who cannot multiply. And then I ask them to do the quadratic formula. I have set them up to fail. My husband's an English teacher. He's got kids in his class that are low reading levels, and he asks them to read To Kill a Mockingbird. He has set them up to fail. So finding a task that is at their ability level that they can be successful at, and you know, personalizing that learning for kids. And then just giving recognition, you know, celebrating you know, when kids meet their goals uh, it can be a great way to gamify your class. So that's my list. So um, I'm going to go through some examples here, but here's the thing that I want to encourage you to do. Choose one. Start small and choose one. Where you're going to fail if you decide you want to try gamification in your class is you, you jump in the deep end, you're like, I'm going to do badges, and we're going to do leveling, and we're da 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 Gamification it requires a lot of data record keeping, and that can really be a challenge. So if you're going to do it, do it small. Just do it a little bit at a time, and it's at a data level that you can manage, that you can gather the data and do something with it. Because if you can't give that immediate gratification, like you find out that they've earned a badge and you're able to give it to them right away, you kind of lose the effect. So start small, choose one. Giving out XP points. Now XP, experience points, does not have to be um, 
the points that they earn on assignments. It could be. And that's what I'm going to do for my dissertation. So I figure, you know what, we already collect all of these points. And you look at the progress report and it shows that they earned 2,036 points. We just don't talk about that. We always talk about the percentage. But you can take those and say, okay, well, you have 2,000 points, you're level 20. And you have 2,020 points, you're level 21, right? You could do that. But it doesn't have to be those points. I know a lot of teachers will just use it um, for, you know, you come to class on time or you participated, you helped other people. Just ways to encourage behavior that's not connected to the curriculum. I'm really passionate that I think your grade should reflect what you know. Um, and so if you're uh, giving out points for turning in homework on time or for being a good neighbor, then it inflates the grade and it doesn't really have the grade reflected in it. So you can use XP points for anything you want, and then you can make them worth whatever you want. You can have as much fun as you want, because they're not meaningful in the sense that it impacts their grade. So you can help them to level up and have opportunities to celebrate. You just earned 20 points! You know, finding those opportunities to cheer for students. Um, another way to use XP points is to vary the point values. Like, why does the assignment have to be worth the same number of points for every student? So, my husband's an English teacher, right? He assigns a book. You know that only 50% of the students are going to read that book. And you can beat your chest and these kids, they won't read the book. That's right, they're not going to read the book. But you assign that as the only option. So, all right, I will give you 50 points if you read the book. I will give you 40 points if you read the cliff notes. I will give you 30 points if you can identify 10 key vocabulary words. I will, you know, right? Find a point of entry that a kid can feel successful at. Like, I'm willing to do that because for me, something is better than nothing. And if they do something, they're going to have forward progress. And success builds success. So even if I can have that tiny win and they see forward progress, I can then use that to build the thing. Okay, let's try something a little bit harder. And I can move that kid as opposed to having him sit there and just do nothing. So varying the point values, and you could use that as a system to level up. So I have uh, on my website is a template for this. If you'd like to take a look at it, it's just a Google spreadsheet. So what students do is they X off when they've completed a task. Um, and you can see that I have here how much XP the assignment is worth. And as soon as they X it off, they level X it off, they level up. So this particular one is really complicated. You should not start with this. Start small, keep it simple. Um, this can just give you an idea. This one I wrote a spreadsheet formula that as they level up, the easier tasks slowly become zero. So they can't go back and just do a whole bunch of chapter one, because I give them choices, right? You can do this or this or this. So they can't just do a whole bunch of the same thing. Erica kind of already went over this. But when you give an assignment, put a story on it. It doesn't have to be a real story. So I got my examples like, we're not uh, building a bridge. There is a fiery volcano that is about to erupt, and you have these tools that you have to build a bridge to get off the island before you become a crispy toad. Just put some sort of story with it. Whatever you're doing, why are we learning this? It doesn't have to be, because someday you might build a bridge. I don't know any bridge builders, none. So if you can't find a reason why they might actually do it, and even if you can, they're not doing it today, make a story, give them a narrative, put a, put a theme around your unit. Uh, elementary school teachers are great at that. Create a themed website for it, right? So we're not uh, math class, we are on Survivor! And we just do some activities, you just theme it. It's the same assignment, you just put some, some storyline behind it. So you create a website that says, you know, here's the rules, here's the quests. Uh, that we're going to do. That's just the assignments, but you just put some fun words to go with it, uh, I can really just elevate it. So that's a pretty simple way to get started using gamification with your students. Choice. And I said this before, I think this is the most, my, if I were to tell you to do one thing, it would be this. Now, I'm a parent. I told you I have five kids. I give them choices. You can have a timeout or a spanking. It doesn't have to be a good choice. <laughs> you know, you just have to give them a choice. You want broccoli or lima beans. And kids then feel like they have more control over their environment. So um, just giving them different things like, so what I do is I number all of my assignments. I'm really big into this. I use Google Classroom. It automatically creates a folder for me. So when I number my assignments, uh, the folders are now in the order that I created them. So really super helpful. Uh, but what I'll do is I'll name my choices by the assignment number. So you can see these are all assignment number 23. And so all the students know this is the learning objective for 23. But here's what they could do. They could do page 157, went through 27 odd. Now those first few problems are the easy ones, right? So I'm boring the snot out of my kids who already took algebra. So option B, right? 
broccoli or lima beans. You can do numbers 25 through 35. You know, just get, you can do the harder problems and skip the easy problems, so there's a choice. You can create a screencast explaining each step. Or you can model this in Minecraft. Just give them some different choices. Dif focus on the learning objective instead of focusing on the assignment. Just give them different ways that might interest them to approach the, uh, the learning objective. So just by doing that, I think you'll get a lot of students having a little bit more buy-in. So I have an example. This is the list that I use with my college students. I have a quest list. I have like 100 things on here that they can do during the semester, and they have to do 50 of them. So at the beginning of the semester, they don't get that. Like, what do you mean you don't have to do all of it? You don't have to do all of it. Which one of these uh, appeals to you? So a lot of these things just prepare that students feel uncomfortable because it's new. So you just have to encourage them. You have a low risk of failure. Um, but giving them some different choices, I just make a spreadsheet and have different things they can choose from. Just so we're clear, the answer is always a spreadsheet. Yeah, I love spreadsheets. So leveling, you know, you are level 10, right? Something to celebrate. You know, we have kids, they have, a, they have an F, and then they do some work and they still have an F, and they do some more work and they still have an F, and they do even more work, Maybe, just maybe, I will give you a D. Like, who does that motivate? But even if you have an A, you have an A, and then you do work, and you still have an A, and you do work, and you still have an A, you have nowhere to go. Where do we celebrate? I want to find excuses to celebrate with kids. So if I can somehow have them level up, we have things that we can goal set for and to celebrate. So I have here is a template for, it's a to-do list. And so you just list in here, and I think it's a good idea to break down into subtasks. Because again, you want to be able to find ways to scaffold it, right? So you just create the things that students need to do. And I did the XP, made it up. It has nothing to do with their grade. It has nothing to do with how many points the assignment is worth. It's just kind of like how hard it is. So then you can put student names along the top. And as they X stuff off, they level up. Now be careful about this. Do not just put a whole bunch of students into a, a, a competition to-do list. Remember I shared this with you before, competition can actually be really demotivating. So I let them choose their own groups and it's optional, right? They can just do it, them, they can just do it with one student and see themselves leveling up. I have a template for this so you can just use it straight up without knowing any spreadsheets. Um, but if they want to group together with a few of their friends and they want to compete against each other, I'll tell you what, when I see my friend was level 27, I really started doing my homework. From, even though I'm a doctoral student, I'm fairly motivated. It's still really, really motivating to compete against my classmates. So this is one of the things that we use just amongst my friends um, for my doctoral program. Anything they use that provides visual progress. Uh, Class Dojo is, if you're not familiar with, is a product that allows you to kind of mark if students are behaving themselves, if they're um, being kind to others or. Uh, there's negative points too, but it gives a visual progress to see that the student is consistently um, behaving in certain ways and it shares it with the student, it shares it with the parents, so they feel like their behavior is connected to uh, some sort of an outcome, right? So it's visible. So any chance that you can get to give students a visible way of seeing forward progress, I think is positive. I do have links to Class Dojo and Brain Pop on um, on that website, alicekeeler.com slash BETT2015, and I'll show that at the end. Badges, badges are just used to help recognize things. I, if you wanna jump into badges, my recommendation is to have five. Five badges they can earn. It's not a badge per assignment, it's not necessarily a badge per unit, there's five things that they can goal set for and achieve, because I can manage whether, well, five things, like checking off, did you get this badge, did you get this badge? Starting slow, don't offer 20 badges. You'll quickly be overwhelmed. Pick just a small number so you can figure out a system for handing out badges that works for you. So this is an example of the template that I have for your level up challenge. Um, I have a template on here that is completely generic, so you can make your own challenges and you can use that with students or teachers if you're doing professional development. But what it does is I can, when you exit off, I can have it display a badge. And it's just a digital badge and I do have the directions for how to make those and how to put them on there. Um, do not feel you need a badge for every single task. That's going to make you tired, right? So not everything and what, if you start off giving a badge for everything and then you stop, that's a problem. So I want to really emphasize start small. 
give badges infrequently at a level that you are able to manage, uh, making sure who has it. But when I do it this way, where the students kind of self-select and then it gives them the badge without me having to hand it out, then it really makes a nice distribution. And you can tell this is another Google spreadsheet because <clears throat> that's always the answer. And then I have a tab here that shows them in a grid and they can print that out. They can also do file publish to the web and embed it on their website to display their badges. And so this is just a way to kind of hack that. Play sheets. So a play sheet, most of the time you'll see math games or actually most educational games are what I describe as play sheets. They're the exact same problems that you would see on a worksheet, but now you've got some sort of ninja that will kick the right answer. Uh, you have a pig that dances. In this case, it's a mock-up of who wants to be a millionaire, or no, what is this? This TV show's been off the air for so long. Um, yeah, I think it's who wants to be a millionaire, you know, you ask, answer questions and then you earn money. I mean, this, I literally got this math problem out of the book. It's the same problem. And you'll see like the Jeopardy game that we play with students, that template could be used in any classroom. What does Jeopardy have to do with parabolas? Nothing. So a play sheet is going to be a game that really the game part does not further the learning. So it's not game-based learning in the sense that the game doesn't help me better understand the material. But when you have small children and you give them a tablet, what do you have them do? They play educational games. Let's put quotations on that, right? They're games, but they're learning something. So we recognize that when kids are young, that they're going to be engaged with these gaming elements and they're going to learn. So if we think little kids can learn with gaming elements, why not big kids? So I'm a big advocate of using play sheets uh, because, again, if the computer can grade it, it should. So I use quia.com, quia.com slash web is actually the one there in the middle. And it'll just allow me to create games really easy. I just type up my content, I would do it in the five minutes between classes, and I would have a game for my students to play. And it grades it for me, so it really takes a burden off of me, right? So that's my presentation. Uh, you can find the slides and resources at alicekeelow.com slash BETT2015, and I would be happy to take any questions.